Hey everyone, I want to welcome you back to this episode of Close Quarter Dad. Today, uh, I am with uh, my friend Ben Winter, and Ben is the author of a number of great books. I'd invite you over to his website to uh, to check him out. But the one that I was really interested in sitting down and having a conversation with him about is uh, what to expect when having expectations and uh, using the anger of unmet expectations to find peace. You know, one of the th challenges that we face as parents is directing or projecting, I should better say, our expectations on our children and thinking that they're going to know what they are, like thinking our kids know what we expect. In Ben's book, he actually uses a number of examples and uh, even goes so far as to, in the appendix, kind of give different, l like, sort of... Um, where you are in your place in life in different scenarios uh, that sort of backs up his work, which I found very interesting and, and helpful. Um, but what I'd like you to take away from the conversation today, and hopefully uh, uh, Ben and I are going to go deep into this and you'll be able to kind of peel some value out of it, is redefining how you enter into dialogue and conversation uh, and activity with your children with a newfound sense of expectation and uh, and instead of assuming that they're going to expect uh, actually defined that expectation better so that both of you um, not only have the outcome that you're looking for in whatever it is that you're doing whether it's a lesson or you're teaching or you're just going fishing or you're doing whatever it is we really want to be clear in these expectations so, Ben, I'm so thankful that you're joining us in this conversation today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. This will be great. Yeah, you know, I just want to jump right in on improv. <laughs> That's really, you know, you start you start with that, and you kind of, I love how you sort of have a play on that word a little bit here. But I'd like to begin the conversation with the importance uh, in this, in improv and communicating expectations. Yeah, so... The premise that I always come from is that we live a life of improv. You know, none of us wakes up with a script. We have no idea what the day is going to throw our way. And so improv is one of those skills where whether you're doing it for a stage performance or you just want it for life skills, it really teaches you how to live in the moment, how to take things as they come and, and not sort of bash heads with it. It's sort of like, oh, this is what's happening right now. I guess I need to deal with it. Um, rather than say oh, i'm just i'm just going to deny that this is actually happening at the moment and so yeah improv as a life skill is just something that's so important and necessary and uh whether it's life or stage you know there's a point where you have to start speaking about specifics and specifics really equates to expectations you know setting those boundaries and those levels or those ideas say this is what i need and want and this is where I am. And so it's, it's so intertwined. But, um, you know, if you just remember, we live a life of improv. And if you learn how to do it more effectively, it's just easier. So <laughs> when you say improv, we're talking about like improvising in the moment, right? Yeah. Uh, or are we talking? Uh, yeah, we're talking about um, and, you know, so when I started thinking improv, my mind immediately goes to sort of theatrics. But uh, I hear what you're saying. Um, and, and is improvising more in your terms in the moment or if we're looking forward into what we're doing, how we're going to pivot into that? Or is it in more in the moment? It's a bit of both. Uh, improv, okay. for the most part, is very moment by moment. It's sort of just yeah. you, you can plan ahead. You can say this is what I want my day to look like. But when something comes up that doesn't match what you had in mind, that's where you kind of have to pivot and really f be in the present to understand okay this is what's happening it's not what i wanted to happen but now i have to work with what is um so it's it is very moment by moment uh it when you th when you were talking about theatrical you know one clarification is a lot of people hear the word improv and they think stand-up comedy and it's that's not the same thing exactly Im yeah. improv is more like a person or group of people that you know, they'll get suggestions from the audience and then they'll make something from nothing. But in, you know, everyday world, the suggestions come from our surroundings and what's kind of put into our view at the moment. You know, I, yeah, I think that 
Yeah, um, the, the question I had was really based on kind of you go, you roll into a next uh, uh, really clearing something up here, which is, you know, the, the fundamental difference between known and unknown expectations. Mm. So that's kind of sort of trying to see where improv plays in between those. But before we get into that, what are some tools or skills? Is it something that you found that people are really kind of born with or it comes from, I know you go, we go into deep into the book about um, experience and subconscious, but like what are some tools right now that we might be able to apply to make ourselves better at this improv? The biggest tool in improv that's really going to just change everything. It's, it's awareness. And then awareness mm. is a very tough thing because a lot of times we want to ignore what's happening rather than take a step back and say, oh, this is what this is what is um, accepting what's happening in the moment. You know, a lot of times in life where we don't have the money that we want or the living situation we want or the relationship that we want. And so we sit there and deny the fact that we we're not where we want. We're like, no, it's fine. Everything's fine. I'm I'm perfectly healthy. I, I this relationship's fine. Right. We deny that it's not what we want. And before we can do anything, we have to accept where we are. And a lot of that acceptance really comes to awareness of, uh, okay, you know, I'm kind of not where I want to be. So what can I do about it? Uh, and one of the things that I talk about in the, the expectation world is that being upset is one of those great trigger points in life where you can take a step back and say, hey, I'm upset. I didn't know I whether I knew or I didn't know I had this expectation. There's something to explore here because the only reason we get upset is because an expectation hasn't been met. And if we don't know that we had this expectation or where this expectation might have come from, because maybe it's our parents expectation of us and that's not what we want. You know, this is where it gets really deep and everything. But we have to stop in that moment and say, hey, I'm upset. I have an opportunity to grow. And that's a, that's what awareness is. I have an opportunity here. Whether you do anything with it or not is beside the point. But the, the, the first part is of being aware. I now have a choice. And so that's why I think awareness is such a big tool to kind of hone in on and master. Because if you're aware of what's going on, you can do something about it. If you're ignoring what's going on, well, you're just kind of going to suffer through it for a while. Yeah, that awareness is a tough tool to really kind of master, though, isn't it? It's one of those, like, it's one of those, you got to go to a university to master that tool. But you said something really interesting here, and I think that when, I like, I like how you phrased it, um, and I'd like to maybe step into that a little bit, where we say when we're upset, or, you know, hey, maybe there's something here that we need to discover. Uh, maybe there's, uh, let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, what about doing that with our kids maybe when and in in would this be a way are you suggesting to teach them that awareness and to help them have better agency of their own self-awareness by when they are upset say for example i'm not going to respond to you right now instead what i'd like to do is recognize right now in this moment that you're upset and i'd like to do some discovery here and really work in on that uh, is am I am I hearing you correctly here? And is that would, would would that be in terms of expectations be a good first step to help them with that tool uh, for being able to have that awareness? Well, I think it's two parts. I I think you're definitely onto something uh, in working with a kid and and taking that step back for them because they don't they don't know how to do it. Yeah. But to say hey I I recognize you're upset. Let's explore this. The other thing is kids learn from example. So if you're upset with your child or you're upset with a a situation in the day if you set that example of like taking that step back for yourself and saying oh wait i'm upset with you let me check in with myself figure out what's going on or why i'm upset you know like what is it you're doing that i didn't know i had an expectation about um you know as a parent i always watch myself when i get upset with my child it's like Nope, that's my mom talking. No, that's my dad talking. No, right that's on. society yeah. <laughs> talking. I don't really care, right? It, it's fine that he's doing this. It doesn't matter. Like, it's not going to affect the world. It's not going to break my bank. It's, it's like, it's not an issue. Like, he's learning. Like, let him learn. As opposed to, oh, don't do that. You'll hurt yourself, right? You know, whatever the voices that, you know, your mom has in your in the back of your head from when you grew up. 
Um, and so yeah. I have to constantly check in with that. But I do like exploring that with a child because it's like, hey, you're upset. What's going on? Like, let's explore this. Let's figure out why you're upset. Because sometimes they're not upset for the reason we think they are. They're upset because of something closely related to what we think is going on. Um, you know, my son plays sports. Uh, he's very much into lacrosse and he puts a lot of pressure on himself. And so when he's not doing well, he gets upset and I'm like, okay, so who's putting this pressure on you? Like, am I expecting too much of you? Is your mom expecting too much of you? And he's like, no, I just, I kind of expect this on myself. And I was like, okay, so let's play with this. Let's explore this. Like, why, you know, what is it you're wanting to do or accomplish? And you know, what is it going to take to get there? You know, rather than beat yourself up about it, like, let's work through it. Um, <clears throat> because sometimes, you know, like, I don't know, it's really weird watching him because there's there was a, a time he was like, I'm full. And he still had like half a plate of food. And, you know, we're out and about. So we're not going to take it home or anything. I'm like, OK. And he's like, I'm sorry. And he's like apologizing for throwing this food away. And I'm like, what? You know, am I? getting upset with you when you throw away food is your mom getting upset with you when you throw away food like i get there's just, there's a fundamental thing of like we live in this world waste blah 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 that's that's a whole different topic but here's a child who's feeling bad about throwing away food i'm like where is this coming from like i never make you feel i hopefully i'm not making you feel bad about throwing away food when you're full right it's like trying to really f hone in on figuring out where these kids come up with this stuff you know was it a, where'd that come from ben we, we couldn't figure, figure it out. out like it wasn't I, uh. I think it was more of just him putting pressure on himself to finish things um and that's kind of his personality like it really the more i explored i'm like this is just who he is like some of this stuff does just come from somewhere that we just can't define <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah i think that's a that's a really cool tool uh yeah. you know what i'm hearing here is i like how you said that with lacrosse where your son is being really tough on himself and the first thing that you do is you kind of like remove you you, you step into the discussion with all right let, let's see what's not affecting you and let's remove that from, okay now and then you begin to gradually kind of hone in and then you're able to really discover where the trigger point is for him and then you'll be able to speak to that Exactly. So I think that's, uh, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, because if I just started saying, like, hey, I'm not putting pressure on you, chill out, like, that's not solving anything, right? That's that's, that's making right. it about... That's right, and that's what most of us yeah, do. that's making it about me, and it's not about me, it's about him. It's like, okay, so yeah, what's really going on, dude? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's so true, because I can recall, you know, a couple, when my boys were playing Little League Baseball, and there'd always be those you know, there's always the bleacher mom and dad, right? And their kids would be out and they, they, they're, you know, they miss the ball and they throw the, you know, they just, or whatever, they throw their mitt on the ground and they get really angry and their dad yells at them from the bleachers, come on, knock it off, suck it up or something like yeah. that. But that's just, you know, really, really interesting stuff. Let's go into, um, you, you explain in the book known and unknown expectations. And it, I mean, it's pretty obvious. It just, by known and unknown expectations, but you clarify it. Can we, uh, can, can you share that with us a little bit? So a lot of times we have our known expectations and that's, that's a lot of the times where we just, we tell somebody like, Hey, I expect you to be here at this time. Um, yeah. You know, contracts are a huge, just known expectation. When you sign up for insurance or you sign a contract for a house, it is literally spelled out for you. All the expectations of this transaction of what's going on, of what you're signing. Most of us don't read it. Um, we sort of understand what we're signing. But, you know, if you actually read it, you'd be like, oh, this is why I'm not getting covered for the giant hailstorm that's going to hit my house or whatever. Um, or some random fire that comes through the neighborhood that's never happened in 100 years. Right. Like now I know I am not covered for this sort of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm in the Denver area and we had this the huge giant fire that came through like a suburb neighborhood that just tore through a thousand homes it was crazy um so that's where that came from but anyway uh you know we we have some known expectations out there um but most of our expectations are unknown um until they're staring us in the face and a lot of those are subconscious like one of the examples i always give is like hey honey take out the trash right 
There's right. a lot of expectations in that statement. The person's kind of wanting you to do it right now. They assume you know which trash they're talking about. And, you know, you, if you're married long enough, you're with somebody, you kind of start to understand them um, through past experience. But at the same time, there's not a lot of specifics there, like which trash? When does it need to be taken out? You know, does it take into account that I'm already doing something else right now? You know, there's a lot of discussion that hasn't happened. And so when that trash doesn't get taken out, then the person starts to get upset. But they don't realize that they had this expectation of like, hey, I asked you to take out the trash. You didn't take out the trash when I asked you to. So now I'm, oh, wait, I had an expectation that I didn't say out loud, right? It's like, oh, I'm upset. I didn't share my expectation with you. Like I just assumed, right? How many times do we just say, I just assumed? <laughs> yeah, Ben, I had actually a question about that. In the book, when you talk about that, uh, you know, she says to, hey, honey, can you take out the trash? And I think you said that you know, you're sitting there watching a game or something like that. It's on a Sunday afternoon. You said, yeah, no problem. I will do. I got yeah. it. And you, as you just said, she gets upset. An hour goes by and it's like the trash isn't out. And I'm wondering if in that example, are we talking sim strictly in the expectation of her uh, her giving the request? Because he also didn't say, yeah, uh, the game's going to be ending at three. And as soon as it's over during half, there was no expectation from him from the response given. Right. So are we looking at clarity in these expectations, both from the request and the answer? So that I think where I'm going to with this is that like we want to make sure that when someone asks us of something, uh, that we are, we give clarity in the expectation within response too. Is, would that be accurate? Absolutely. It is a two-way street. Uh, and in that example, yeah. I really do dive into, you know, he's not in the clear. He could have said, yeah, which trash? And do you mind if I wait until halftime? You mind if I wait yeah. until this commercial or, you know, this break or the game's over? Whatever it might be, it's like it requires both people to – quote unquote talk and communicate and negotiate something it's not a one-way street it never is you know so if somebody says honey take out the trash you know your job kind of on the other side of that is like okay which trash and when you know let's let's yeah. fill in these blanks for both of us so that we're on the same sure. page um yeah. you know and taking out the trash is a simple example but you know you you get into something else where you know, maybe you're thinking about marrying somebody. Guess how many expectations are around marriage and living together, right? Um, there's a lot to explore and unpack. It's like, well, what's cleaning day look like? <laughs> is there a set cleaning day or is it kind of as needed? Or, you know, what are the finances look like? What is, you know, all that stuff. Who's cooking and when? Yeah. Um, how often are we going out? How often are we staying in? You know, there's so much to a relationship and some of it gets figured out over time. Uh, you know, most people wouldn't hopefully wouldn't enter in a marriage without having sort of figured some of this stuff out anyway. But um, there's so many expectations in relationships. And that's why a lot of them are unknown until they're staring you in the face. Like I didn't know I had expectations around my child until I'm sitting there interacting with my child and it's like, boom, here's an expectation that's not being met. Um, there's been plenty of times where I've had to take that step back and say, this is a child with a clean slate. He does not know how this world works. It is stupid for me to expect him to understand uh, how the world works. You know, a two-year-old, they don't understand what a car is, let alone getting hit by one if you run out in the street, right? So we get upset yeah. for our child running into the street, but we haven't taught them, like, this is bad, you know? When you run into that, <laughs> when you run into that wall and you get hurt, just imagine a car that's like probably more solid than a wall, traveling at a higher speed. Like it's going to hurt way, way more. Like you got to teach these things to a kid, you know. And and kids are they're a clean slate. They don't know the world, and it is our job as adults to teach them the world, not to get upset when they don't know the world. Right. And there's a huge distinction. Yeah, even with there. any news, any new process that they do, anything, anything that you're teaching them. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, yeah, they're absolutely they're learning how to feed themselves when they're really young. Right. They're learning mm -hmm. how to use a fork and a knife and a spoon. They've never used them before. So when they don't do it right or they make a mess, but they're learning, they're processing, you know, that's it's silly for us to get upset with them that they've got to practice, you know, Look back at your childhood when you were learning how to write, 
it was not clean and pretty. It wasn't legible. It was silly, but you're learning how to do these things. And so a lot of times we have to take that step back as an adult and say, oh, yeah, I'm teaching my child this. They don't know it yet. So it's I I should not be getting upset at this child for this thing because they don't even know about it yet. Right. So a lot of times we have to check in as as parents to just, oh, OK, I'm getting upset at him for not having learned something that is my job to teach them. Eh, OK. <laughs> it calls into question of is it's it's obviously not the the parents expectation isn't getting met when the child's making those mistakes. And. I know in my martial arts school for the last 20 years, when I was when I've been working with some of the young mentors, some of the you know the older teenagers who will, who will assist me with a kids class or something like that, one of the things that I teach is uh, uh, never correct, explain what you expect, uh, and try not to correct and say you're doing it wrong, do it like this, you da da da, but actually go in with okay, this is what this is what we want to see the outcome be. So, um, and then when they, then when they attempt it after you've explained the expectations, then that second round, you can apply a correction. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to provide, and and I would love to hear your feedback on this, maybe, maybe adjust my model here a little bit. But the first thing is, uh, don't correct immediately out of the gate, but explain what you expect. Then once they do step into their attempt, that needs to be acknowledged and recognized for what it is. So you'd offer some praise at that effort. Then you would apply one correction, not a whole suite of them, because they did this, 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 and that, and this, and that, and this, and that, but one thing, and then you invite them into doing it, attempting that work again. So we kind of have this, you know, don't correct, explain what you expect, and then we go into the praise, correct, praise model, uh, and then rinse, repeat, and optimize, and, and continue to make it better. How does that sound to you? And what what would you what would you uh, suggest that I tweak there? I wouldn't tweak a thing. That's great. I, you know, it, it reminds oh. me of school. Cool. But, <laughs> I mean, it reminds me of school. You know, you think of kids. You know, they start with like math. They start learning one plus one equals two, and then as time goes on, you add on to it. You you add more to it, and you know now you've got multiplication. Oh, now you have division. Now you have fractions. And now you have to figure yeah. out what X is. But you can't go straight to algebra if you don't teach those fundamental things. So it's like, okay, I expect you to understand algebra at some point, but let's start down here. Uh, sports, the same thing. You're you're not, you know, starting soccer day one with giant big nets. You're learning how to move the ball with your feet. You know, it's a very fundamental thing you have to start with. And then once they start understanding one piece, then you start adding more to it and more to it and then more and more and more you add on to it. So I think the way that you're approaching it, um, that feeds into a lot of what I teach with improv is not making somebody wrong. You know, if they if they do it incorrectly and you say that's not right, you're making them wrong and nobody likes being wrong. That's right. But that, you know, when you start to say, OK, I see what you did. This is what I expect you to do. Uh, try it again. And then, you know, make those small adjustments. It's It all works out. They're not being wrong. It's just, it's more of like, okay, you did this and let's add this. And now you did that and now let's add this. And it's sort of just adding on to the moment. Um, and in improv, that's called yes and. It's like, yes, this is what's going on and let's try this and, and let's add that and let's adjust to this and you know, it's not making somebody wrong. It's it's showing them new and different ways to do something until you get the desired outcome. So it's great. Ben, you just blew my mind. You just blew my mind. I have uh, someone important in my life, and she is always like, when I'm having a discussion, we bump up against something. There's always this yes and mm -hmm. or both and like, OK, <laughs> let's keep rolling with this. <laughs> And now I know where it comes from. <laughs> yep. So that's really, yeah, yeah, man, I dig that. So we're talking about um, inside the uh, improv space. You can't make that mistake. You can't, you can't be wrong, but you can get clear definition on expectations with the yes and. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, let's talk about where these expectations, where expectations as a whole uh, comes from you know you mentioned in your book that uh, you go into subconscious and programming right 
like if we could rip this down to the studs so that as parents we understand more clearly what ex what like what the source is of these expectations and i know we could talk about fear and a bunch of other things here but like in their most basic form what are we talking about so as i mentioned a kid is a clean slate and so when they grow yeah. up they experience life and how they experience life really equates to how the parents parent, how family members are around them, how they interact at school, what they watch on TV, all those sort of things kind of shape what their view of the world is. And that becomes their subconscious moving forward. So if you're in a loving and caring household and you grow up and you go out into the world and you start seeing people not being loving and caring towards one another, it's kind of messing with your world because you're like, wait, that's not how people are supposed to be. Right. And the opposite. You grow up in a household where everybody's yelling and fighting all the time. You go out in the world and somebody's nice to you. You're like, wait a second. You, you're why are you being nice to me? Like, what's the end game here? Like, when are you going to explode on me? Right. Because they grew up in a world of, of hate and anger. And so if you think about it as a parent and there's a, it puts a lot of pressure on us as parents when we start to recognize whatever actions and information I give to my child is forming some level of a world that they're going to operate from for the rest of their life. So how can I be most effective as a parent to make sure that they have the best chance of survival? <laughs> right. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, you know, you can go into paralysis of just trying to figure out what's the best approach here to teach my child so that they have the best chance at life. Or you can just sort of adjust and correct yourself as you go on because I feel like that's what's most important. It goes back to that awareness that we were talking about. If you as a parent constantly check in with yourself, you're always checking in on your awareness of what's going on, correcting yourself and saying, that's not what I wanted to do or let's explore this, like let's grow from this experience, let's learn from it, let's dive into it then all you're really doing is teaching your child how to kind of work through issues in the future, which I think is way, way better than trying to get them like just firing on all cylinders moving forward. If they can figure out how to solve problems for themselves because they saw you do it, uh, they saw you help them do it, uh, then they're going to be able to solve issues later in life so much more effectively um, and very quickly. Like, it's just not going to be a thing. Um, whereas if you constantly just are butting heads with yourself and the people around you and you're never solving any problems, well, then they're going to grow up just not solving any problems and just learning how to butt heads. And no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Right. You know, you look at society today and so many people are just sitting there butting heads like I don't believe in your beliefs, but you should believe in mine. But I don't believe in your beliefs and you should believe in mine. And it's like, ah. OK, well, we're not getting anywhere, whereas teaching people to be uh, um, empathic and sensitive to each other and um, learning how to do the whole yes and with people. OK, I see that that's what your beliefs are and that's OK. You can have your beliefs. I have my beliefs. Is it OK that we have our own separate beliefs? Uh, I guess it is. Right. Um, now we're moving on and we're and we're not butting heads. So I think it's really that subconscious programming that we put into our kids that we don't even realize we're doing. A lot of times it goes back to we're sort of instilling into our children what our parents instilled into us. You know, how often are you like, oh, my God, my mom just came out of my mouth when I'm parenting my child or, oh, my God, that's what my dad always said when I was growing up. And now I'm saying it to my child. Is, You're not kidding. Right. Man. Is that what I want to be teaching my child? Yeah. And some of it's great stuff. Absolutely. There are some morals sure. and ethics that get passed down from generation to generation. And it's great. It's not always bad. But sometimes we hear something come out of our mouths and we're like, mm, that doesn't really apply now. We have a completely different world that we're living in with new technology like that doesn't even make sense anymore. So why would I instill that onto my child when it really wasn't effective for me? And I don't want to be that or say that or do that. So um, awareness really comes back into it as an adult, because if we can teach ourselves awareness 
and demonstrate that to our kids as they're growing up, then they sort of learn inherently how to be aware and, and work through things because kids learn by example, hundred percent. They learn by example, you know, we can say yeah, things that's all a day, great point, but yeah, you, you made a really good point, Ben, a second ago about, um, the you doing it with them and uh you know you have doing having them do something and and but but you doing it first rather than being there and motivating them which seems good or pushing them forward which a lot of guys think that that's the way that they're going to get their kid to do something um or even by using force which never works uh, one of the things that I have in my program is crossing the stone bridge where it's like when we, and, and I know you get into the topic of fear with in, in, in expectations and its important role in fear. But when I'm interested to hear your opinion on this, when a parent recognizes that a child is scared of crossing a stream by stepping on the stones across to get it to the other side, the parent says that, it recognizes the risk first recognizes the, the 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 challenge so the parent brings him or herself down to the paradigm of the child and what the child sees but then steps onto the stones him himself crossing the stream turns around shows that it's possible to cross that threshold and then invites the child to do it and what I'm hearing is, is that you're you're suggesting a very similar model to that, right? Because you're 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 you're, you're acknowledging that no, there, you have every reason to be scared here. You're, you're right. There's a, you, you could slip on these rocks, you could fall and get soaking wet and cold. There's a lot of things here that could happen. There's a lot of different ways of unpacking this, but it is possible for you to do it. And I'm going to do this first, regardless. We still need to get across the stream, and this is the this is the easiest way to do it. So. And then once the father does that, then they are able to show the child that not only is it possible, um, but someone else has done it before them and shown them the way. So am I kind of hearing a similar message there with you? Absolutely. That's uh, huge. Because, again, yeah. they, you know, we can say one thing, but our actions speak way louder than words. And kids pick up on that. Um, you know, I... Every now and then I'll walk through a store and some parents like yelling at their kids and then they start counting. Um, and the kid has learned that <laughs> I have until the count of five to straighten out my actions before any consequence really comes down to it. And there, I mean, that's what they learned. But had, you know, I learned very early on in parenting that when I say something, that has a consequence, I've got to be willing to follow through on that consequence. And oh, sometimes yeah. early on, I, I set a consequence that I didn't want to follow through on, but I had to because I said it. And so that I learned very quickly how to set those consequences to something that was okay for me to follow through on, uh, because it was important for my child to recognize, like, there's a consequence to your actions. And it's not a count of five where you find out it's like you here's the situation here's the consequence and and we follow through on those consequences it's there's no count of five for it it's you're not a, you're not a two and a half guy Ben. no no it just One, happens two, two and a half <laughs> yeah no and and those parents that count they don't want to follow through like that's why yeah, they that's, why, that's why they ended up counting they don't yeah. want to follow through on their and and so the kid does, doesn't learn um because it's, there's, I lost my train, but it's it's right there. Uh, basically, like, we're teaching them that it's okay through words versus actions. That's what it was. Yeah. So yeah. the words are saying one thing. The actions are saying something completely different. So the kid learns the words don't mean anything until you get to number five, right? Until you've really lost your your mind and you're really really pissed off and then you'll take action on what you said but i have until yeah. five to do that so right. whatever um so i i think the biggest thing is as parents is like be true to what you say and demonstrate it you know i grew up not really knowing what my like i didn't know my dad was an entrepreneur growing up like he left the same time every day came home the same time every day i thought he was going to an eight to five job working in an office building. I didn't understand that he was kind of in sales and he had to make his own money. 
and he had to work hard to do so. And I didn't even know that was an option until I became an adult and was like, oh, that's what you were doing. Right. Mm. So I went to school thinking I needed the office job with the salary and all this other stuff. Now, maybe my dad wanted me to do that so that I didn't struggle the same way he did. I don't know. But I didn't even know there was an option because he never talked about it. Um, you know, same thing with like money. You know, they struggled with money growing up. And, you know, every time that I wanted something at the store, they're like, we can't we can't afford that or we can't we're not getting that. But they never really talked about why. They never said, you know, we only make a certain amount of money and we have to pay these bills and this is how life works. And so if we want to do something, we have to save the money up. Oh, okay. Well, I'll save up money too, right? Kids are so amenable to doing things. They're like, oh, I need to save money to get it? Okay. Teach me how to save money to get it. They don't understand. Like, again, they're a clean slate. They don't know these things are even possible until we talk about them. So I think... Uh, I didn't get as good of an education of being a person or an adult as I possibly could have because my parents weren't as communicative around certain aspects of life. Now, they didn't need to like sit there and spew fear into me like, oh, we're going to lose the house. We're going to live on the streets. No, nothing like that. I, obviously, they wanted to protect me um, and I get that. But at the same time, there's ways to talk about things so it's not scary or weird, but it's just a way of life. Uh, and so I, I work on that with my son. I'm like, you know, yeah, I'm having a good month. I've made a lot of sales. I've, I've got a lot of stuff going on or, Hey, no, you know, we're not going to go to Dave and Buster's today because you know, that sale didn't come through or, you know, I've got these bills that I have to pay first, whatever it might be, you know, just showing them like life changes. Life is different. It's not always sunshines and rain, sunshine and rainbows or whatever, you know, there's, there's been where. Where are you on uh, third place or participatory trophies? That's a tough one. Uh, I do think there's something to be said about striving and, and getting that first place trophy. Um, because I think if you work hard enough, you should be given uh, or shown the respect of having worked harder than anyone else. Like, I think that's that's a piece. I don't know that I I'm not necessarily against participation participation trophies because, you know, some kids just want to know that they were included. Yeah. Uh, and but I do think like if you're first place, yeah, you get the big trophy. You worked hard for it. You deserve it. Um, even a second place trophy like that. You know, we watch the Olympics. There's first, second, third. Right. Um, the fact that you were at the Olympics is kind of that participatory award and you probably get some swag or whatever to say, yeah, I was at the Olympics. Cool. So I think from that standpoint, it's totally okay. But if you give the first place team the same award as the last place team, then what's the point? Right. Um, but I also think it comes down to setting the expectations around kids and sports at whatever age they're in. Um, you know, yeah. So contextual to the expectations, contextual to the age there. Right. Because, yeah. you know, if you're six or seven, you're still learning how to play. Don't even worry about, you know, first, second, third, whatever. But, you know, as you become a teenager and you start getting more competitive, yeah, there's, there's a benefit to winning all of your games. You get a big trophy at the end. You get to celebrate. Um, <clears throat> and I think as time goes on, that, that becomes more like that. Uh, but we, there is something to be said about encouraging kids to keep going when they're young. Um, but showing them like, yeah, you, you participated. That's great. But see, you know, if you strive and work harder and push yourself, um, to do better, you know, if the coach says go practice at home for an hour, well, you get that, you get that big award over there. If you practice at home for an hour, okay, right. I have to work harder to get the big award. Right. And I think there's something to be said about that. And, you know, the way the world works as adults, the, you know, I'm not saying the harder you work because the word hard has a negative bias to it. But if you strive for more, you're going to get more. And I think there's something to be said about teaching that at a, at a young age. 
There was a conversation I had when uh, when my youngest son was playing basketball, and he was uh, <clears throat> he. It, it, I mean, one of the proudest moments I had with him was his last game as a senior on the basketball team because he started playing when you could pick up a basketball in school, and he did not he did not go to any other sports. He quit little league baseball when he was very young, and he was just basketball. That's it. And he made the JV team when he was a freshman, and he was excited about that. But he was always second string, and uh, he made it to the to varsity. And you know, when when we got to the, I remember him when he was like ten years old. He said, "Daddy, I'm going to be on the varsity basketball team one day." And when he made that varsity team, I I just got all teared up. And his final game, and the, you know, the last game of that journey was really an emotional thing for me. But it calls back a discussion I had with his mother when he was really bummed because he wasn't getting picked to play. And I'd be interested to hear your opinion on this. And I may have been wrong here, uh, but I've oftentimes stepped back into this conversation and tried to reflect what the expectation was in my message versus his mom's. And we didn't, we didn't collide on this. We actually had a pretty meaningful discussion after it. But my son was bummed, and he was like, I didn't get picked, and we lost, and and the the response was, well, you know, don't worry because you all had fun. You all showed up. You played the game. You had a good time, and that's why we're here, right? And I looked over at her and I said, no, no, that's not that's not. And I didn't do this in front of him, but I said that's not correct. We're here to win the game. We're not here to have fun. We love the sport, and that's why we have fun. So playing. Play, coming here and showing up for a game, the goal, the collective goal as the team, is to win the game. Practice and in practice is the hard work that we recognize we have to do for that accomplishment. But we play the game because we love it. We, we play the sport because we love it. But when it's game time, our one expectation is to go after it as hard as we can, as smart as we can, and to s find a way to be victorious. And if we're not, we take those learnings back and we rinse and reap it. We do it over again, and we learn from that experience. We don't. We're not. We've, because I feel that if we, if as parents we say to our kids, "Well, don't worry about it. You all had fun." What you're doing is you're dismissing the lessons that can be learned, so that in the next game, we can push harder. That sting of losing is really important because it helps you to really, in my opinion, I, in, I'm interested to hear your opinion, but that sting of losing really helps you to identify what your where your failures were your weak points or where you could have been better or fill in the blank so therefore it's critical that they have the expectation going into the game that we're here to play a game one is going to win one is going to lose uh, but the sport we love what are, what are your thoughts on that again kind of it's kind of stepping into that participatory thing mm -hmm. and everybody's having fun and blah 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 but like, why are you playing the game, man? That's what I'm interested in. I, I think the way you said it is absolutely perfect. Uh, and I, I don't think I've heard it any better way than that. So I 100% I agree. And I think it's the coach's job to say, hey, we lost. Um, here's the lessons we can learn from it. Here's what I saw as a coach of where we fell short. And how can we improve through practice to overcome that shortcoming? So the coaches really play, a, a, if they're doing their job correctly, play that role very, very well. I think as parents, you know, there's something to be said. Are you, are you having fun even through loss? Great. And th this goes back to that yes and. Yes, as long as you're having fun, that's great. And what can you learn from the sting of the loss? Well, yeah. So I think it's both. I think yeah. I think both have a, a place but you can't, to your point, you can't dismiss the lost stings and there's a lesson to be learned because there's absolutely a lesson to be learned. In life, same thing. You, that relationship doesn't work out and they break up with you. Okay, what lesson can I learn there? Um, you know, that sale fell through or, you know, that business venture fell through or that house fell through or whatever. There's a sting to a loss that we can take as an opportunity for growth. And I think the same thing, going back to the whole expectations thing that we've been talking about, if you're upset, if you take that as an opportunity for growth, 
that sting of being upset is going to give you an opportunity to look back and say, what lesson can I learn here? What can I gain from this? Where can I grow from this? Um, and I, you know, I think kids understand when they show up for a game, they're, the expectation is to win. We're showing up to win. And so when we don't, we get upset. And I think it's a natural state when it comes to sports. And so if we're teaching our kids, hey, you're upset because you lost, what lesson can you learn from it? Then that's going to teach them a lot more than like, so suck it up, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you put it in all capital letters in your book. It was uh, be upset, use it, and learn from it. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, then, yeah, right on. Um, I'd like to pivot into uh, another really important topic that we talk about, and that's the connection of expectations and loneliness. Mm. Um, I'm wondering if we can, uh, if you can share with us uh, some of your feelings there, why this is really important. Yeah, that that was one of mine. Um, one of my life lessons, you know, as, as a kid, I didn't really have a lot of self confidence, and so there was. I was lonely a lot. I didn't have a lot of friends. And, you know, a lot of times we, when we're kids, we get these expectations, these programs that are just deep seated of like, I don't have friends or people don't like me. Right. So we'll grow up because of one traumatic experience, like where our friends turn on us or whatever. So now we're going through life of like, I struggle with making friends or having friends. Um, but we don't recognize that this is what's running in the back of our brain because it was programmed into us as, as a child. So here we are, you know, we're in a social situation or we're at work or, you know, we, we we're trying something new and people just aren't approaching. They're not saying hi or, or whatever, you know, we get to feed that program to be right. Cause just like we don't want to be wrong. Our programs definitely don't want to be wrong. Like that's their whole purpose is to be right. And to, and to do what they're supposed to do. So if we have this program of nobody likes me and I'm always alone, then that program is going to try and run uh, your day-to-day -day life to be alone and that you're not likable. And so it's it becomes frustrating when you're in a new situation, a new social situation. You're like, why can't I talk to people or why can't I make friends with people, right? Um, you get upset. And that's when you get to take that look back and say, oh, I'm being affected from my childhood on a regular basis here. I have to make a new choice. I have to try something different. So in that social situation, if you normally wouldn't go up and say hi to somebody or start a conversation with somebody, you now have to force yourself to do something opposite of what your program is telling you to do. The, the, the easy way. The easy way is to sit in the corner and watch the world go by. But in, instead, you have to like, I'm going to go talk to that guy that's also sitting in the corner who's probably afraid to talk to everybody else because I know I am so I'm going to go talk to them um, and let me just tell you if you befriend an introvert in a social situation they will be the happiest person ever they will like I don't want to say it in a bad way but they'll latch on to you they'll be like your best friend they'll they'll sing your praises because you made them feel included um, and that's, I think a lot of introverts just want to feel included. They just don't know how, um, or something happened in their past where they just, it made it difficult. Um, so I'm always on the lookout for the introvert sitting in the corner. I'm like, I'm going to go talk to that person because I know that's what they want. Um, but yeah, expectations and loneliness, it's, it really just comes back to our subconscious running us on a regular basis. So if, if you grew up feeling lonely as an adult, you have a lot of work to do to get out of that because your program has had years, has had years to run in the background. It's really good at running. Um, so you have to constantly recognize a situation as like, oh, I have a choice here. Uh, I don't want to be lonely. I want friends. So I have to try these new things to interact with people. And interact with them enough where they decide they like me to invite me to something they're doing. Um, so I might have to invite them first for five or six times before they're like, oh, this guy really wants to, like, do stuff. So I'll invite them to my party or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, anything that we've had subconsciously programmed into our brain as, as a kid can take a lot of work to overcome as an adult.
And I think you also shared here, uh, <laughs> myself too, is we hear our parents coming out of us sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm also concerned with if we have struggled with that loneliness ourselves and it being a, you know, sort of a byproduct or an outcome of how we're handling expectations, that loneliness, then this is a pattern we can break as parents right now so that that doesn't happen to our kids, that they struggle with that. And if we don't, then would you think that they run the challenge or the risk of dealing with that same loneliness? Uh, you know, let me just, I'll just say it bluntly, Ben. Do you feel that if you didn't do this work on expectations and being able to approach life with a yes and, that your son may have some of those, face some of those same challenges you did when you were young? Absolutely. Again, it goes by example. If if yeah. I showed the example of avoiding people and the world and talking to people, uh, then that's what I'm teaching my child to do. Um, now, fortunately, his mom is very outgoing and talks to a lot of people very, very easily. So, you know, she's got that dynamic. And I've, I've done a lot of work to become more self-confident and being able to just go and talk to people. Uh, so, yes, by doing the work and showing him what's possible – and he's he's also in a very awesome school where they they talk about emotions and thoughts and feelings and they're very empathetic and sympathetic to one another you know so he's always out there looking out for his fellow classmates and his friends and making sure they're included uh, so I'm very grateful just from that standpoint as well but but yeah if I hadn't been working on myself then I would be showing my child a completely different world and it's not one that I want him to ever experience because it's loneliness is sad. It, it's not enjoyable. <laughs> you know, that's why yeah. it's got a negative connotation to it is nobody likes being lonely. That's, oh, yeah. That's, the, that's what we want in life is to be loved, to be love and to be creative in that uh, in that action of love and to be able to express ourselves. So for sure, if whatever we can do to break that pattern in ourselves is going to benefit our kids. Ben, you, you talked about the, um, we, we kind of touched on the, the uh, using upset. Uh, and then I kind of quoted something from your book here, uh, be upset, use it, and let it transform you. But you bring that, you bring that point forward when you are uh, discussing obsessive thoughts and brain conflict. Um, I'd like, you know, I, I really want to, I wish we had a little more time together because I also <laughs> want to get into fear because this is a huge thing for my community. <coughs> Um, and, and, and maybe if we can tether the two together somehow, I don't know if that's possible. I know that's selfish for me to ask, but, <laughs> but in the place of upset, and if we go to, we take the brain conflict that we encounter in not being able to have our expectations met or not having clear expectations given to us. And therefore we subconsciously trigger and we leak out sideways and we create this upset or we're able to rationalize it. What I'm hearing from you, I think, is we're able, we're able to rationalize it, and we're like, dude, you're not being clear with me. You're not giving me the expectations I need. Or we lose the game, and we're able to, you were able to see why we lost, and we're able to take that, that upset and use it, and then like at the end of your book, you say, go forth, right, and, and keep doing this. But when we get to fear, we step into a whole different suite of dynamics, past trauma, in, uh, feelings of not mattering or incompetency or not having value or uh, not capable as a man or as a father or or an imposter syndrome thing. So fear can fuel, fear, fear I feel can be fueled by a whole lot of things and as a response creates a freeze when men have to be able to respond quickly, whether it's through threat or whether it's decision making in business, whatever it might be. It creates a freeze and a gap because of that fear. I know that's a lot. I'm really kind of, I'm, <laughs> I'm really front loading this question big time, man. And I, I, I appreciate you for, for listening to this, but I really am concerned and curious about how expectations can sort of be the sword and shield that we need to overcome that fear, even when we're carrying a lot of those different traumas that make that, that sort of define that fear for us. Um, there's a lot there I know. Probably yeah. could write a whole other book just on that, but let's talk about it for a minute. So I think it's, it can be summed up very easily with our fears are possible 
expectations or outcomes that we expect to occur. Uh, and it's based off past trauma, based off past experience. So one of the things I always talk about, it, you know, in the, in the flow chart of this that I created, one of the questions really is, you know, have you shared your expectation? Um, a lot of times when we have expectations of a partner or, you know, and I'll, I'll just use sex as an example, you're entering a relationship and you have desires, right? Well, what if I share that expectation with my partner and they, they freak out and now we break up, right? Um, there's a lot of fear there because maybe you opened up once with somebody about what your desires were and they did leave. They they ran away. So now the next time you actually want to talk about your desires with somebody, you have this fear that if I talk about this, they're going to run away. Um, that's one of those things. You know, we have this expectation that if if this happens or if I do this, X will happen. Um, and X is a past experience. But what if the opposite is true that, you know, this time you share your desires with your partner and now you have the best relationship ever and it even gets better and better. Uh, well, now you've just gone against that fear, against that preconceived idea of what's going to happen um, and you've broken through it. And I think that's what fear is, is it's that barrier of like, well, do I try it again <clears throat> and see if I get a different result? Do I try it differently to get a different result? Um, and is it something I really want to break through and get on the other side because there's something amazing over there? Uh, so fear does stop us a lot. You know, when when we have an expectation of somebody else or a need for somebody else, it can be as simple as like saying like, hey, I need you to be on time when we meet next week. How hard is it to ask somebody to be on time? Yet we're afraid of upsetting them. Like, well, I'm always on time. What do you, meh, right? Yeah. So, you know, when we set meetings with people, there's an underlying expectation of, you know, let's be on time. And one way that I get around something like that is I, I put it back on myself and I say, you know, hey, we're meeting next week. Just so you know, I'm kind of an early person. I'm usually early. So if you show up early, I'm probably already going to be there. And it's kind of saying like, hey, be on time. Because <laughs> I'm going to be right. sitting there waiting on you. Um, and either people care or they don't. And I could absolutely be more blunt and just say, you know, hey, I'm usually the early person. Um, if you're not, you know, communicating, you know, if you're not there on time, if you're not communicating that you're running late or whatever, uh, after 10 minutes, I'm out. I'm, I like I'm that, though, be Ben. I like that. I like what you just said there, because yeah. for some people that, you know, they might be for you, you're kind of sending sort of like an under under the table message like, dude, don't be late. OK, because I'm going to be there. Yeah. But for some people, it's just a concept or an idea until they put it to word or to put it to pencil and then it becomes sort of owned and you make yourself accountable because now you're sharing it with someone else. You're now saying like, hey, look, I'm going to be there at this time. So rather than just clicking a link on Calendly or something, put in your account, your outlook you're having that conversation and what in the format that you're saying you're now I'm in, in like in my brain it would be that okay well I said it. I, I I now own it and I have to do it it's not just digital or virtual but for some people it might be different like for you what you're saying is like you're using it to kind of be you know to, just to reinforce like look I'm not a late person I will be there so I hope you will be too yeah and again if we just recognize that a fear is an expectation of a possible outcome, um, then we're aware of it and we can work through it. Uh, but if we just see fear and then run away, there's nothing, we're not growing from it. We're not learning from it. We're not doing anything different. Um, mm. And I think that's something we can work with our kids and just say, hey, I see that you're afraid. You know, you're afraid of crossing this river. Um, you know, you have an expectation of slipping and hurting yourself or getting wet or something you have some fear so let me show you a different way let me show you how you know possibilities so that's something we can do is we can take fear away from our kids by showing them and you know sometimes we have to step through our own fear to do that you know i'm i'm heading to hawaii in uh, july and i got my son scuba certified and 
we're going to do a night dive with manta rays. And That's awesome. let me just tell you how afraid I am of that. That's like <laughs> the ocean at night is a very terrifying thing for me. So I'm going to be working on my own fears. And I know he's a little bit afraid of it, but, you know, he's going to be more confident in going through that if I'm also willing to go through that um, and show him that it's okay. Way to go, man. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I, it's yeah. like... Uh, I can't tell him to get past his own fears <laughs> if I'm not willing to do mine, right? It's That's back right. to that exam- show by example. So That's right. That's right. So, yeah, cool. it's uh, it's important for us to recognize fears for what they are and to work with them, not, not against them, but with them. See them yeah, as an for opportunity sure. for growth. For sure. Ben, uh, you know, we're up on the hour. There's a lot more to talk about. You know, there's uh, we can talk about boundaries and agreements and things like that that you discuss in your book and some of the, the some of the great examples for applying the format that you have. Um, but I, I, want, I also want to be sensitive of your time. Uh, I have one last question for you. Sure. And I usually I usually put this in the container of going back to a younger you. Uh, but I'd like to shift it here based on this discussion and and your wisdom. If you were to stand by a young man who had just, for the first time, realized that he's a dad, you're at the hospital, maybe you're dropping something off for someone or you just happen to be going by, and you see a young man, and he's sitting there looking at his baby in infant care for the first time, and you're standing there and you're just kind of appreciating that moment because you remember when you were doing it with your son and you're like, yeah, there's a young dude and he just became a dad. That's pretty cool. And that guy looks at you and he shares with you that he just became a dad and you see he's illuminated, but you see he's exhausted and tired and, uh, and all the fears that we faced when we first became dads of like, it, you know, it just got real. Like, how am I going to pay for this? How am I going to protect this? How am I going to like raise this? How am I going to all the things, all the things knowing what you know now and with everything that you've shared with us on this episode, you know, if you were to put your hand on that man's shoulder uh, and you just had a couple minutes, what is the, what would you want him to know? I think it would go back to what we talked about in that the child is new to this world. They don't know how the world works. They don't know anything about this world. (laughs) And I think that's strange for us to comprehend is that here is a brand new child on earth they know nothing about this planet they know nothing yeah and it's our job to provide them information and teach them and just to remember to have some compassion with that because they don't know so there's no reason to get upset with them when they're trying something new or learning something new because they've never done it before Literally, they've done nothing on this planet before when they're brand new. And so we just have to remember to give them time and space and compassion uh, when they're learning about planet Earth. (laughs) So, um, you know, go easy on yourself and go easy on your kid because they don't they just don't know. Yeah. Right on, Ben. That was wonderful. Uh, Where can people find your work uh what do you want us to focus on uh and if we want to learn more about your book and i strongly urge every uh father to who's listening to this uh, and you want to get more clear with expectations and understanding how they affect your life to uh to step into ben's uh, work but ben where is that and and how can we do that so the best place would be going to my website, which is havingexpectations.com. And you can, uh, the flow chart that we've talked about several times, you can download that for free. You can awesome. uh, find links to the book and uh, go from there. Great. I will, uh, I'll put the link in the show notes as well. Uh, ben, you know, I wanna, we're going to wrap it up now. But before we go, I just want to thank you for all the work that you're doing. This has been, uh, I mean, I've, I've had two moments that I can go back to. <laughs> that have been like, poof, like really kind of opened me up a bit and I appreciate you for that and I also appreciate the work that you're doing in the world here uh, helping people from all backgrounds not just parents not just my audience but uh, having touch points with people to help uh, bring their life to a better place uh, and helping them to go forward in life uh, with clearer expectations which just brings more joy and love and, and all the things man so 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me.